Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So for this year on All Things LGBTQ, I want to go back and talk with some of our old friends that we may not have talked with in a while those programs that are offering services to our communities and the people who are doing that work. And today I couldn't be more excited to welcome back Anne Ward, the executive director of Mosaic. And hopefully we're gonna talk a little bit about how the floods of last year truly impacted this organization and what it is that we can do to help them in their recovery process. So with that, welcome Anne. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so let's start with, you know, if you would just briefly give an overview of the mission of Mosaic and why our communities would access your organization. Sure. Mosaic's work is to heal communities and end sexual violence. And what that looks like is supporting people who've experienced sexual violence um, in a variety of different ways. So we might uh, we'll meet somebody at the hospital and support them through a sexual assault nurse examination. We have a 24-hour helpline. Um, we connect people to area resources. Sometimes we have support groups. We do all kinds of healing artwork. Um, and we try to figure out what people need. You know, each person's unique in their response to things that happen and have different ways that they want their community respond and different, different ways that they wanna seek justice from the community. We also do a lot of prevention work. And this year we've, uh, we've been deeply exploring the connections between substance use and sexual violence and doing prevention of substance use and um, prevention of sexual violence, um, both in schools and the community. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that um, was pretty deeply impacted by the flood almost a year ago now. And a lot has changed for us in that time. Okay, we, so go I was going to say, we'll circle back and talk about some of those individual programs because you are offering some phenomenal services. But I want to talk a little bit about how you all were impacted by the flood last summer because it had a true impact on Mosaic and its physical structure and you've been in a recovery mode for almost a year and actually just opened in new space. Can, can you talk a little bit or could you share a little bit about what that process has been like for you? Yeah, you know, we, we were preparing for the flood on July 10th last year in um, that day in, in more of a supportive context, we were thinking, how is this going to impact our community? You know, we had the sense that there was going to be pretty severe flooding that was in the news. Um, it, we didn't really think that that would include us in our facility that wasn't high on our minds um, during the day that day. So our preparation was what will our community need from us? Um, what will sexual violence look like? In the aftermath of a disaster, you see a real um, rise in the incidence of sexual and domestic violence. And what will our response need to be? Um, what will our resources need to be? And that afternoon, um, we were we were surprised to see the floodwater hit our driveway. And uh, we had a pretty, you know, emergency response to that to get our cars out and to let the folks know who were staying with us in our shelter facility. We had folks living with us in that building um, know that we were we were in an emergency situation and needed to evacuate. Um, 
Mosaic has has long served, you know, we were we we're a pretty special organization. We've long served people of all genders. And um that's it's pretty complicated when it comes to evacuating to a congregate care facility, right? Like an emergency emergency response facility like the Barry Auditorium, like a typical Red Cross shelter where where everybody's in there together and, and sleeping in cots. Um, what we know about um, people who are LGBTQ is that um, some of us are not necessarily safe in congregate care. And um, that may have been true of, of some of the folks that we were caring for at that time. And so ours is not a typical evacuation to, you know, okay, everybody walk up the hill, right? We were walking distance from the Barry Auditorium. And, and that's just not, not necessarily um, what, what the situation that we were in. And uh, so there was a lot of attention and care given, giving needed to, um, to who we had in our care and and what the emergency response was and um, you know just for confidentiality sake we're, I, I'm going to leave it there, um, but that was creative over the following weeks as we as we understood which portions of our building would be inhabitable afterwards and which ones wouldn't and um, we we had a you know what was a dead building essentially for a period of time afterwards and the community was huge in their response to. Um, the immediate aftermath of, of needing to get mud out and floors ripped out and walls ripped out and um and eventually a, a, our boiler functioning <laughs> temporarily um and some of us living in portions of that space um but ultimately it was determined that we would not be able to stay and we were really really lucky to um, find somebody who was interested in doing what they could do to preserve that space and to preserve that space in a way that it would continue to serve the community long term. And so we sold that building and we sold it to somebody who's working really hard to maintain um, transitional housing units there um, and to work in partnership with area nonprofits to make sure that it stays a housing resource. And that's been a really big lift um, for that family to meet the codes and standards and, you know, to to do things like take all of the facilities that were in the basement and that were flooded and replace them to rewire the building. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of things that we, we could not have done. Um, you know, it was months of me trying to learn and understand building systems and codes and standards and, and work with... Um, local state and federal authorities around what would have to change because we were um, you know very flood, firmly in a flood zone and can't expect this to happen again so you, go ahead i was gonna say and you ultimately were able to find new space that you just had an open house yes you know when we started looking and we said how are, how are we going to find a space that you know, when people come to us, they they need to feel safe, right? And what is it? What does it take to feel safe? Um, and we started looking at commercial spaces and um, commercial spaces for rent. You know, you walk in and the vibe isn't isn't always great, right? And it, you know, the picture of the empty commercial spaces that you see around here. You know, there's the Staples Plaza, <laughs> right? Um, you know, you walk into some of those and it and it's like we just need that 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 feeling of safety and life and vibrancy. Um, and we wanted a space that we could create that in. And um, the same family that purchased our building also had another space and gave us an affordable option. I know it's pretty amazing. I know, <laughs> we call them our unicorn. Um, it was just this, I mean, magic really this opportunity to um to step away from something that um really was pulling the organization organization down right we were we were drowning in the aftermath of this flood and to step into you know this um this lovely old home and you know our offices are in old bedrooms and we have this vast dining room that today today has 16 13 to 15 year old youth who are 
learning sex ed and consent and um you know we we have space for that now and we have this you know really just warm cozy living room where we're doing our core team meetings and where we're where we're where we're bringing in people to have really hard conversations sometimes with law enforcement instead of going down to the police barracks and um and being in those interview rooms um you know they're surrounded by um plants and um murals on the walls and um you know it 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 feels different and it smells different and the windows are different and i'm i'm not in that space right now this is i'm not there um but you know our our vibe is different. Um, our spirits are lifted. You know, we're, we're, um, we struggled this year, all of us. Um, we kept our services going. We've done some really amazing work um, in spite of the flood this year. I just, I have so much gratitude for the staff who picked up so many pieces, you know, while I was like, completely flood brain and working on codes and standards and counting two by fours. And they just kept the programs going and kept the connection with the community and kept the outreach going and making sure that um, those other needs of the community were happening and, you know, moved us into that space and generated this, um, this incredible sense of safety. And, you know, we're approaching that, that um, bring the PTSD, but we're also feeling so much gratitude and so much joy for where we are right now and the, the ways we're going to be able to serve the community going forward because of this transition. Okay, so let's now, let's real transition into talking about some of the specific services of Mosaic. My first question, though, is when you were talking about the new space, you didn't mention if you were able to or unable to recreate the safe space, shelter space. Is, is that something that Mosaic still has as one of its programs? So we are still doing some transitional housing work. We are being um, more discreet about where that is, given the opportunity to not tell people where that is. It is not in our new location. Okay. All right. So you, you mentioned, well, there were two very new initiatives that I saw on the Mosaic site, and one of which all things has been promoting, and it's the Let's Talk Sex series. And you just made reference to, you have this big, beautiful new dining room where you could bring our youth in. I have to tell you, seeing the advertisements for that, and in an era where other states are trying to restrict the information to which our youth have access. You're trying to expand it. And I know there were two separate workshops that are ongoing. Could, could you talk a little bit about that initiative and how it came into being? Sure. You know what? We can't we can't take total credit for that. That's actually the Vermont Department of Health um, that's funding us to do that. And, and it's, it's a statewide initiative and it was already in Washington County. So it's been offered, um, it's been offered here before. And I think that there is another group in Washington County who's also offering it. And there are, so it's a curriculum that, that we're working with and there's some flexibility in that. And Mosaic was really interested in getting involved in this because um, you, we like to add our, our twist to it. We like to make sure that when, we're talking about sex and sexuality, that we're making sure that there's there's quite a bit of information in there that is um, LGBTQ informed. Um, we like to really talk about consent. Um, you know, we like to also make sure that there's pleasure positivity in these conversations, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, and so anytime that youth are exposed to these ideas, but you know, Vermont is a state, like you said, other states aren't having these conversations at all, but Vermont is a state that, that we can feel pretty proud of is, is doing the work, is trying to make these things possible, and that is stipending youth to attend. And I, I think it's pretty funny today, because actually one of my one of my youth is, is attending today, and um, when I brought him the poster and I said, hey, do you want to do this thing? 
um, do you want to go to sex ed right after school ends? Um, he, he looks at this poster and it's, you know, it's sex ed. This was terrible. It's so funny though. He calls his friends and he goes, Hey, uh, after school ends, do you want to go, um, do you want to go listen to adults talk about sex and get paid $125? <laughs> And I was like, whoa, 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 okay. Okay, well, yeah, that's kind of, that's sort of, kind of, but it's not just listening to adults talk about sex, right? Like this is an interactive, um, we're really gonna engage the youth. And um, and Mary and Amy are just such fabulous educators and they're so great with youth. Amy's been a, a teacher for 24 years and um, you know, it's middle schoolers there today and they're just gonna have such a blast. It's a, a three day, 15 hour, um, you know, learning opportunity for them. And I'm really excited for all of them to attend. And, and after the middle school, you're doing a, another series with our adolescents, which yeah, we have a high entire... school one later this year, later this summer. Okay. We, we will be promoting that as well. I, and, and thank you so much for taking this on. It's, it's one, uh, I still remember being a queer youth and there was no one from whom I could really get information. So all I heard were everyone's stereotype about what it meant and how you went about it, of which of course, none of it was really true. Yeah. The, other, the other initiative that I've seen on Mosaic site that was new to me is the Military Sexual Trauma Support Group. Would you please talk about that? Sure, that is a group. We had an intern, um, so that might be a little bit outdated. We had an intern who was running that group because um, she had, uh, she was an MSW intern, so looking in, you know, training to be a clinician and um, was approached by a veteran who was really open about wanting to work with other veterans and you know, that, that experience of sexual violence while in the military and that experience of how little it's talked about and how unacceptable it is to talk about it, which is something we hear about pretty frequently. And we also have, um, we've had some shifts in what that conversation's looked like in Vermont in the past couple of years, just with some shifts in um, in the Vermont National Guard and who's who's responsible for um, for responding to incidents of sexual violence. Um, so it's an it's an interesting time in the state of Vermont to be talking about sexual violence um, in the military and uh, something to be watching um, in the coming years. I was gonna say I I saw the notice on your newsletter for which you know, I, I am a subscriber, which talks about you know, these are the big events and you had you know, tie-dyeing and making pride flags in advance for this, the Montpelier Pride event. And this was also listed. So if there are people who have an interest and sort of want to know a little bit more, they could ask to go on your list and they will get you know, this ongoing newsletter of, you know, these are the things that are, are happening within Mosaic. Yes, for sure. We have a great newsletter. We also, um, we have a new website, a whole new website that's going to launch in the next month or so. <laughs> I hate to send people to our website right now. Um, but certainly in the next month or so we're we've gotten to a stage in our organization right now we have, you know, a static website, one that we really can't change very much. And um, we're really excited to go to a platform where we, we have this great outreach um, person on our team where we can update it because we have so many events going on. And right now we're sort of stuck with social media, which is a good platform, right? But not everybody uses social media. Yeah. And so it's a good platform for folks who do. But um but a lot of folks would love to use a website that has up-to-date information all the time about what's coming next. Um, we're doing stuff all the time. We have this cornhole tournament that's coming up for folks, the folks who want to go play games, um, connect with the community, um, you know, do something that's supporting us, but isn't, you know, a lot of folks want to engage with us and, and be supportive, but don't want to go anywhere near talking about or doing stuff that's relating to sexual violence. We totally get that. 
Um, so we often try to have um, events and opportunities to engage where we're not having those conversations or we're not, you know, thinking about that stuff. Um, so we have a fun, we have a fun opportunity coming up to do that. Um, you know, summer is a little bit more quiet, but we'll be doing some bingo in the fall. We also, we're going to do our big um, rainbow fair again. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a date for that yet, but, um, but I know that that's going to be pretty, that's going to be something that um, you'll be looking forward to in September. Uh, it was our first ever one last year, but we want that to be an annual you know, tradition where we provide resources, connection and fun for LGBTQ plus youth, um, families, where we share resources and, you know, fun. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate the breadth of events that are being offered and your conversation about looking at different strategies for reaching out because sexual violence is, is something that can happen to anyone at any point in their life. So you're looking at the, the full spectrums of our community and how do I provide services to all of those communities and how do I get information from them about what their needs are? So somebody watching this interview if they say you know i really like to become more involved and actually become more of a helping part of mosaic are there opportunities for volunteers sure for sure um folks can email info at mosaic-bt.org um, we are looking for volunteers. Some volunteer opportunities are pretty intense. Like you can do a 20 hour training and actually answer our helpline at certain hours of the day and respond to people who are in crisis. Um, you know, we are looking for board members. We are looking for people to support um, events and um, and fundraising. You know, there are there are also times when we need posters hung in um, places like Cabot or Waitsfield um, or Waterbury or even locally um, to help get the word out about things that we're doing. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways um, for people to get involved depending on what their interest and availability is. Um, envelope stuffing is a popular one in November. <laughs> it really depends. Right. And, and I'm sure that like any nonprofit in Vermont, you are always looking for, if you can make a financial donation, please do that. But are there other, maybe some specific types of donations that Mosaic is looking for? Because I know in the past, there were things that were needed for the shelter. There were things that were needed in the office. There were things that were needed for outreach. That's a really good question. Um, typically, I think our, our asks vary from, from time to time. Um, our new website is going to have a running list of those things. I would say that what we, what we need most often are the things that survivors are asking for that we don't have specific funding for. Um, if somebody has a request and it doesn't match what our funding allows um, and we want to fulfill it, like we had a request from a youth um, who had experienced um, an assault from a, a caregiver um, to go to this, uh, this really special event like this she just wanted to go to this really fun thing that was expensive and we wanted to send her to it and it would have been this day of fun and it was a total teenager thing to go and do and uh i'm trying to be discreet here right yeah you know and we just needed a hundred dollars to ha let her go have this teenager experience and um and we were able to do that um with it with a gift card but I would have loved to have had, you know, that gift card on hand, um, or somebody have had 
made a, a you know that donation or or said I want to provide um, this experience for somebody and so massage gift cards or um, you know opportunity gift cards um, think about what kids or adults around here could do to um, blow off some steam right to have an opportunity to heal. Um, right? What do you need if something really bad happens to you? What would you want to do to relax afterwards, um, to feel better? What, We'd love to you, have some of those on hand. You know, what do you need for your recovery process? So in, in the very limited time we have left, the new website is coming up soon. There will probably be a wish list that people can go in and check. You've got a 24-hour hotline that if I wake up at three in the morning with flashbacks, whenever there is someone I can talk to, do you have standard office hours or do you ask people to please call before you stop by? Oh, we always ask folks to call before we stop by um, because we're a response agency. So we might be in the field. Um, and we're a locked facility for safety reasons. Yep. All right. Um, yep. All right. So th thank you for taking your time to spend with us. I feel honored to be able to talk to you again. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Hi, everybody. We're here today to talk about the Rainbow Bridge Community Center in Barrie. And for those few of you in our audience who don't know, Rainbow Bridge Community Center is a nonprofit devoted to serving the needs of the Central Vermont LGBTQIA2S plus community located in Barrie. They center on creating a safe, accessible space to support community resiliency through advocacy, education, support, and play. We, they strive to be a true community center where joy, healing, and love flourish. Um, a very worthy mission statement and description. I'm here with Heather Ely, the executive director of the Rainbow Bridge Community Center. Uh, when not working on building community resiliency and queer joy, they spend their time smashing words together, wandering wild spaces, delving into weird rabbit holes, and throwing shiny math rocks. <laughs> what are shiny math rocks? They are dice. I like oh. to play tabletop games. Yeah. They, they play what? Tabletop games like D&D. &D. <laughs> Great. Um, so tell me, thanks for joining us, Heather. Thank you. Uh, how did you happen to become involved in the Rainbow uh, Bridge Community Center and how long have you worked there? I became involved in the Rainbow Bridge Community Center pretty quickly after I moved to Vermont, which was in October of 2022. So I haven't actually been here very long. Um, I was looking for community and I wanted, I showed up to volunteer because that's, I've always been a volunteer. And the first thing that I do when I get into a community is find ways where I can like plug in and help. So I showed up and offered to host a writer's group and a board game night, both of which are still going. Um, and from there, I got looped into other work because it was needed and they needed a body that was able to do it. And I have a pretty weird collection of skills and they just happened to fit nicely into what was needed. And what I don't have, I can learn pretty quickly. I'm a pretty curious person, so that helps. So I started working as the director of operations, um, I think around March or April of last year. And then I took over as executive director, I believe in April of this year. Uh, so it's been a, not a terribly long period of time. And for most of that period of time, I was unpaid staff. Now I am partially paid staff. <laughs> oh, you're all um, the bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the the director of operations period mostly involved me developing programs and doing grant writing and um, sort of overseeing like the day-to-day -day stuff that the center needed doing. I wore a lot of hats. I did web development stuff and 
social media manager stuff and graphic designer stuff. Wherever I was needed, I pitched in. Where did you move from? I came directly from Georgia, but I'm actually from Washington State. So I grew up mostly in Washington State. And Vermont appealed to you. Vermont appeals to me heavily. Also, my partner has lived here um, his whole life, and um, I moved up here to land with him after, um, like, many years of avoiding it. <laughs> so <laughs> I've known him for 23 years, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's for, in terms of, like, cultural fit, I absolutely adore Vermont. I grew up with a mother who's a musician and an artist. And I grew up around like a lot of hippies and uh, like homesteaders and <laughs> like just general oddballs. And this state has a lot of that, it has a lot of the same <laughs> vibes, has a lot of the community spirit that I really value and appreciate a great deal. And it showed up a lot with the, like, the flood relief work, seeing everybody come together. Uh, that's always been like, the vibes that I wanted to create and it's already here so I can just tap into that and that's really wonderful like it makes me very happy to be here I'm planning what? on staying for the rest of my life I love it here <laughs> tell me um about the writers group right so it is mostly a space to um gather together and get words on a page and we have a pretty informal group there's not usually a ton of folks there which is fine and they tend to rotate through which is also fine uh prior to running the writers group i was uh, the municipal liaison for pierce county in washington state for nano rimo which is national novel writing month i did that for five years you did and, yeah and so um have some experience i've also been a professional writer for about a decade prior to taking on my role at the rainbow bridge and I just got my bachelor's in creative writing. So I like writing. I like creating communities of writers and that um, we tend to do a couple of writing prompts and share a little bits of writing. Mostly um, it's treated as a social space for writers to get some creative juices flowing. Um, I would love to eventually work on having like a more intentional critique group, but I don't think we have enough folks there to do that yet. Yes. Um, I, thank you for indulging me. This is my personal interest also. I'm a retired English teacher, so I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, words are great. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, Rainbow uh, Bridge uh, Community Center has changed its staff designations. Can you talk about that? Define what you mean by staff designation. I mean, you and Shauna changing roles. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so after the flood, really, um, the flood of last summer, Shauna, as a lot of folks are aware, did a major amount of flood relief work in Barrie. So, Barrie essentially had, we'll say, a lackluster response in the immediate aftermath of the flood. And there was a lot of people in need. And Shauna took, we had a freaking food stand, it's a little yellow bike cart that she would take to the local farmer's market every week and bring um, like produce from a grant that we had for um, from Vermont. And she would distribute produce for free to folks at the farmer's market. So that cart ended up getting filled with the snacks that we had in the center and water bottles and bubbles and like first aid kit. And then she just went around on the bike and started helping people. And she was posting about what she was seeing and that grew into a community response. So like the, the first day it was just her then it was two people, then it was four people, and then it was the whole community coming together. And out of that, um, it became apparent that Barry has a need for a, a long-term disaster recovery organization, yes. which Shauna then um, got involved with Barry Up and is now the executive director of Barry Up. And those are two really big hats to fill. Those are two organizations that fill pretty important needs and it's difficult to manage both of them simultaneously. <laughs> so she's now doing um, the, the position with Barry up as their executive director. And she's the program manager for the rainbow relief funds that we have at the rainbow bridge that emerged out of our flood relief work. So we continue to do work to support um, the community through disaster and we, have a broader definition of disaster than like the federal government does. It's not just after floods or fires, although those are disasters and they're very immediate and real. 
It's also heat is a disaster and poverty is a, is an ongoing rolling disaster. So um, one of the, the ways that we support that is our community cares days, which we do monthly. We're currently on hiatus while we rework that program, but it's definitely coming back. And we partner with the Vermont De um, Department of Health. They do vaccine clinics there. We partner with the Vermont uh, Department of Transfer or Department of, of Labor, and they do um, like help folks with job applications and to like work on their resumes or whatever skills that they need to brush up on. They can help get them connected to resources as well. We also work with Rose Corps Collective, which is a pretty rad group of herbalists and healers, and they create tinctures and other supportive medicines that we can distribute to our community for free. They also do other work outside of that where they mail packages out to other communities of, in, in need of that sort of support. So, um, we and then should, we have other partners that come in on occasion as well. We should step back and identify Shauna. Uh, I will add that uh, our colleague Keith did a informative, energetic, charming interview with Shauna last year. Um, so she's the former ED, right? Uh -huh. And um, just from a community perspective, I think uh, Rainbow Bridge really put itself on the map with its human services during the floods in Barrie. I mean, it, it was such important work and yeah. Rainbow Bridge stepped up and we salute you. Tell me about Barry Up. It's not oh. LGBTQ, but it's intersectional, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, so uh, uh, Shauna and I both really strongly believe that um, all communities that are in struggle, you know, all of all of the communities that are dealing with oppression or you know structural challenges that um, stop us from achieving our full potential, we all have to work together and lift each other up to get to where we can experience liberation and experience like you know freedom from all of the nonsense. And so that's that's really why we had the flood relief the way we do. That's why we in, in included ongoing community support. And that uh, same philosophy is invested in Barry Up. So Shauna very deeply believes in that. And it is layered into her work with Barry Up that we should care about everybody in our community and work to support those who are uh, most vulnerable in our community to make sure that they get the care that they need. So a lot of times in flood relief um, for some of the folks that get missed out on are the folks that can't get access to it. So like people who don't have transportation to get to a distribution center may not get water and food. Um, they may not know how to navigate a FEMA website to get help that they need. And so Barry Up kind of steps in and fills some of those roles by they were sending out people to knock on doors in affected areas to make sure that they were reaching people. And they have folks that can help you navigate through like filling out a FEMA application or learning like what resources are in the community for you. So. I, um, is my understanding that Barry Up is designed to sort of be mothballed <laughs> in between moments of disaster and then have the resources and then the structural network to pop in when they're needed and do the work that's needed. And with this last anniversary flood we had, I think they demonstrated that they've gotten a lot better than we were last year and that will continue to improve. Um, is it true we have a staff of four we have a, a staff that consists mostly of our board members, which is, this is a great moment for me to say that I would love to recruit some new board members. So if somebody is very interested in working on policy, they can email us and we'll talk. But uh, so Freesia is our treasurer. She does handle most of our web um, management now. And she also does all of our financial stuff. And I love her for that. Um, and we have a social media manager who's an all volunteer position, does not get paid at all, neither does Frasia. They are handling posting on our Instagram and Facebook. And then we also have um, volunteer staff that hold down our drop in hours. So we have drop in hours from Monday through Friday, and people can come in and hang out in our space. We have a space that we call the Big Gay Living Room which is couches and tables, and we have art supplies, and we have um, snacks and water and games, and people can come and hang out and play. We also have the Liberation Library there. Um, so there's we are inviting people to come in and hang out and have a safe place where they can just exist and be themselves, and they don't have to come with cash to be there. So um, that and staff, and then we also have the, the staff that is um, unpaid staff that hosts our different social groups. So staff like in terms of actual people that are there working and doing um not just like 
the the drop in hours or the <laughs> the group running is probably three or four people and Shauna gets paid uh paid for her position as the rainbow relief coordinator and I get paid like a half a salary <laughs> for mine <laughs> I don't get paid a ton I don't feel comfortable taking more income than I currently am from the rainbow bridge um, and that will be assessed as we grow as an organization, but I would rather make sure that we're managing our financial assets carefully in the meantime, so. So you're nonprofit and accepting donations. We are definitely accepting donations, yes. <laughs> so we are um, primarily supported through um, local community. Like, so we have some support from Vermont Community Fund, so we get some grants <clears throat> from them, and then we host four uh fundraisers a year we're about to have our summer sizzle the queer dance party that's happening on august 30th at the very um elks club that is um you can go to our website and get tickets to that right now or you can go to facebook and get tickets to that and yeah we also have the winter ball the um autumn carnival and the spring fling and all of this is on the website Yep, and we also have um, the ability for folks to donate to us monthly directly through Give Butter, which is another nonprofit. They don't um, charge fees, so that's the best choice for us to to get donations through, and it's the most responsible way, I think, to protect the money that people are sending us and also our funding. So, yeah. Well, apropos of the space at 81 North Main Street, Suite 2 in Barrie, Vermont, um, it's accessible. You have a ramp. People have to call in advance for the ramp. Is that yeah? So work? we're working on the the building owner currently has um, plans to build a ramp. They have been delayed <clears> several <throat> times due to construction delays. Like they're having a hard time getting the supplies necessary. But it's supposed to be coming this month or at the latest in September. I'm not going to hold that to a fixed timeline because it's been pushed back three times now. But we're working on a permanent ramp. In the meantime. We do have a portable ramp that we can set up for folks to have access to the space. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the clubs you offer. Okay. I have a big list of them here. And I do want to ask you, uh, what I listened to Shauna's interview last year, and there was a seniors group, but that is no longer, huh? What happened yes. to it? The silver, so the silver, the silver elders group kind of fizzled out and I we are looking to rework that. I was working with Sage Equity Grants and we're probably gonna be um, working with them again next year to get a grant to support. I would love to have like a, a, a social group that does social outings because that was what was the primary complaint for this, the Silver Elders group is they wanted stuff to do, not just to sit around and talk. They wanted to be out in the community doing things. So I have a plan to set that up and to have a grant to support it so folks who can't afford to get to the space, you know, and engage in the activity still can come and we can provide grants to cover their cost of the food or the event that they're attending or the, like, if we're doing like a paint and sip, for example, that we can cover the cost of some folks to come if they can't afford to pay. So my goal is to make every event that we have as barrier free as possible to as many people as possible to make sure they can come. The other thing that we were looking at doing is making it more intergenerational so that um, and I would I want there to be space like it to be centered on the older population, but I also want folks to have intergenerational connections. And I think that's really important for many reasons. Perspectives are really good. Having, you know, friends in different ability levels and spaces in their life is really good. And also um Probably one of the key things about the Rainbow Bridge that I think is magical personally is our ability mm -hmm. to create really strong social ties through like low key events where you have something to do with your hands and you can develop trust with people over time. And that has proven to be a really good way to develop social networks and probably out of that, everything else becomes possible. So I, mm -hmm. love I couldn't agree more. Um, speaking of sitting around talking, though, you have discussion groups and support groups. Yep. The Trans NBGNC, Trans Guardians Group, LGBTQ plus veterans, and they meet at specific times in the yep. month. Um, then the clubs and activities, I, I know you can tell me, you've got board games, queer writers group, which you mentioned, um, role playing night, role, role playing game night. Mm -hmm. uh, craft club soliciting with socializing with pride 
That sounds interesting. Yeah, uh, that's probably going to be changing a little bit. Socializing with Pride is changing a little bit because the person that was hosting it is stepping away for a little while. I want to kind of evolve it into something that I'm calling the Queer Adventurers Club. And it's going to be sort of like activities out in the community. And yeah, we're going to have some fun stuff happening with that. But I'm not sure when we're going to start that back up again yet. But that's coming. So yeah. And community open mic. Yep. Poetry, stories, music, comedy, and joy. Mm -hmm. And the Bad Art Club. Tell us about that, if you would. It's very intriguing. This is something that I've wanted to see happen for like over a year, but I didn't have the capacity to run it. And I found two folks that were willing to host it. Um, so I have a daily practice that I call bad art, where I just make art for the sake of making the art. And I don't care about the finished product. And it turns out I make stuff that's really cool more often than I make stuff that's terrible. So um, that's where the name came from. And so we have a project that is like simple for anybody of any skill level to come in and do. And then also you can just make art in community. You don't have to follow the prompts that we have, but we do, we have the art supplies available at the center and we have a project that you can, anybody can access and you can come and make art with us once a month. So that's what that one's about. Well, you mentioned that you have uh, several events coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little about them and just remind us? So the the mm -hmm. dance party is our summer sizzle fundraiser that's happening on August 30th. And um, that is just a dance. Like we're, um, we have different kinds of events for different fundraisers. We have two a year that are all ages and this one is 18 plus. And uh, we have a DJ set up for it. And we're going to have a theme that is somewhere between the cross between the Goblin King's ballroom from the labyrinth and midsummer night's dream and we're encouraging but not requiring costumes and we're going to have some prizes for folks who come well dressed uh i've got elf ears ready and everything <laughs> so, where's it going to be at the um elks lodge in barry oh great great yep. and then the day after that we have music on the porch which is uh like a national kind of movement to encourage people to do music and make community connections and this is going to be set up sort of as like an impromptu jam session and people of all scale levels are welcome to come and we will have some instruments available to lend out and you are welcome to bring your own instruments and we're going to just set up and play music and enjoy each other's presence. That's great. What are your goals for um, the future of Rainbow Bridge? Well, my goals currently are to sort of <clears throat> evolve the organization a little bit. So we didn't, haven't had a lot of like strong policies and all of the sort of back matter of an organization. And that's what I've been really focused on is like setting up our security and safety policy and our grievance policy and all the like unfun work <laughs> of a nonprofit. Uh -huh. And then from that, I really want to push more into like health and wellness initiatives and programming. So I want to partner up more with um, the People's Health and Wellness Center and Vermont Cares and different organizations in the community to expand on our, our health programming. And I want to um, develop out more of our work with local GSA programs. So we haven't done a lot with them to this point. And I would love to like create a grant, for example, to help support uh, GSA programs so that they can have funding to go do like educational workshops and also to have like little parties throughout the year celebrate <laughs> themselves because there's not often a lot of funding available for that I'd like to help support that and then also just to create stronger connections within our different community organizations so that they're more aware of us and what services we offer and um, we can find ways to to where we can fill in the gaps in the community so like we have lots of organizations that are doing really great stuff and in some areas we can help support them in some areas they can help support us. That's like, that's my next goal for the next like six months to a year is to strengthen those community ties and sort of um, evolve the organization up so that we can take the momentum that we've built and create a sustainable organization for the long run. I really think the Rainbow Bridge is magical. I think that we have a lot of potential to be a really impactful organization, and I want to make sure that we are here for a long time. That's wonderful, Heather. And it seems like your personal goals match the uh, mission of the center, so it's a great fit. 
And let's yeah. shout out to Shauna. She's a real dynamo too. I think she kind of put it on the map and now yeah. you're um, you know, continuing to place it prominently in our community. She's got so much charisma. <laughs> oh yeah, in our articulate and you know energetic but you are too um how what can we do to support we in the community to support rainbow bridge so one i would say come to our events tell people about what you know of us like let let folks know we're here we're still battling against kind of a little bit of obscurity um and i i would love folks to just know that we're present um come use our library come use our space hang out with us um if you feel like there's something that you want to see happen in the community that we can support, tell us. We may not have the resources to support it, but if I know it's something that is wanted, I will find a way to make it happen. Uh, you could also support us financially at, um, we have a link through our website where you can support us through Give Butter. One-time donations or monthly donations are all very appreciated. Um, you could also volunteer. That is also extremely important help. So whether you have skills like as a grant writer or you are interested in potentially joining our board or you are interested in helping support like our hiking club or you want to help support the rainbow camp that we have annually or you want to help us with setting up for parties that we're hosting. All of those are things that we would love to have support the community for. Um, yeah, come to our events too. Just come shake the booty with us. That is support too. That's great. Well, Heather, I really appreciate your joining us and all the work that you're doing. And I hope you come back soon to tell us, update us on your progress. Anytime. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.